Next, let's turn our attention to how the vessel function controls the amplitude of the sidebands. So as we know, the sideband locations are actually infinite in extent in both the positive and negative frequency direction, and even on the, the negative half and the positive half, uh, both of these are uh, theoretically infinite in duration. So the Bessel function itself has to be something that sets the amplitude of most of these to zero. So we see that in our infinite summation, k is an integer that begins at 1 and progresses up to uh, an infinite value. Then we see that a corresponds to our modulation index. And the modulation index, uh, as, we, as we know, is called capital I. So we can just make that simple substitution there. So I'm going to explore the shape and characteristic of the Bessel function directly in LabVIEW. We actually have a basic node here that can calculate the uh, first order, or Bessel, excuse me, the Bessel function of the first kind, and it uses just a slightly different nomenclature. It's using X and V, but we can deal with that. So ultimately, I want to get a graph that plots the maximum, or that plots the modulation in index over zero to some maximum value. So I'll put down a front panel control for I max. Then I also want to explore what happens with our sideband number n. So that corresponds to the input terminal V and then to get a whole uh, set of values ranging from 0 to I max I will use the ramp generator the ramp pattern incidentally defaults to 128 samples so I'll just leave that now we see that the Bessel function apparently does not have the polymorphic capability to deal with an array or an individual uh, individual value. So let me wrap that inside a for loop. I will use auto indexing so that within the for loop it evaluates each value of the array and then accumulates that into a new array on the output side. And I'll take a look at the shape of the Bessel function using a waveform graph. All right, let's try this out. So I've set the uh, I max value to a fairly low number at this point. Let me try running that up to 10. And we start to see so sort of an interesting sinusoidal pattern emerging here. I'll just go ahead and set that to the relatively large value of 20. So again, what this plot shows is the Bessel function as a function of modulation index for a specific sideband number. So let me adjust this so it always has the same plot range of plus or minus 1 to plus 1. Now the sideband number 0, that corresponds to our carrier frequency. Now just to make this a little bit easier to update the graph so I don't have to keep hitting the run button repeatedly, I'll wrap this inside a while loop and the weight function, I'll set that to a relatively long value of 500 milliseconds or half a second so that way it's updating my plot and rescanning the front panel controls every half a second. So as I start looking at uh, sidebands that are farther and farther away from my carrier frequency, we see that it takes longer for the amplitude of that sideband to become non-zero. 
If I go back to my carrier frequency, so this would be sideband zero, we see that it has a peak value of one right away. But all the adjacent sidebands have initially a value of zero. All right, let me just make a note to try to help clarify this idea that n is talking about the sideband number. Now, perhaps one thing that's, that's not as um, enlightening here is the fact that it says time, but actually I'm, I'm talking about modulation index running between 0 and 20. So let me show you how you can use the xy graph to handle the independent variable. What we need to do is create a cluster of the x and y values and connect that to the xy graph. Now we see that the value runs between 0 and 20. I'll just go ahead and label the x axis as modulation index. Again, I'll turn off auto scaling and set the range to uh, the fixed value of minus 1 to plus 1. Probably should have done this earlier. I could have just simply re renamed the front panel control to sideband number. Again, we can start to explore now the, the relative variation and amplitude of the sidebands. And again, what you'll notice here is that as a function of modulation index, you see that the values change considerably. Uh, sometimes negative, sometimes positive, sometimes zero, sometimes large, sometimes small. What I want to do now is focus your attention on a particular value of modulation index say 3 in this case, and then watch how the actual amplitude varies as a function of sideband number. So for sideband number 1, for example, we see that the value is quite small. Sideband number 2 gets a little bigger. Sideband 3 it's bigger yet. Now it's starting to get smaller again and so on. So these sort of undulations in amplitude with uh, as a function of modulation index and sideband number is really what gives the FM uh, synthesis technique an awful lot of variety and also a lot of interest as you vary things like the modulation index as a function of time.